mean somebody else that isn't appearing in the corner. Probably 11 second minute. Yeah, a minute and 10 seconds. suspended due to COVID-19, but of course we do stream Sunday morning here on Facebook at 11 and then upload uh, the video within a few hours of the end of our assembly to our YouTube channel. So if you can't join us in person, we do hope that you join us online. Also Wednesdays at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we've been sharing a midweek message to try to encourage us to remain faithful. So uh, that's also uploaded to YouTube later and we do hope you join us for that. I also want to remind uh, everyone of all the options for Bible study and fellowship that we currently have. Wednesday nights at 7, we have a Zoom class that's looking at God's purposes for the church in a series that we're calling On a Mission for Christ. And Sunday mornings at 9.30, we are currently engaged in a Zoom class called Love Does. And that's very much about practical, well, about loving one another, let's just put it that way. And so if you're interested in any of those, you can go ahead and direct message us directly through Facebook, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so that we can get you the Zoom ID and also the class materials. We also have this really awesome Bible study if you really want a step-by-step -step and depth study. If you visit our website, ovchurch.org, and click on the banner for World Bible School, uh, you'll be set to take Bible classes with a Bible study helper for, uh, well, gee, it's weeks. It's, it's as fast or as slow as you want it. 
Why don't I take a look at our prayer list? Uh, besides those that are already on our prayer list, we want to especially uh, uh, point out um, India and Africa who are struggling a lot more with COVID-19. These things don't often get reported in the news. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We also uh, help out a missionary over in India and the works that they do over there named Paul Reganathan and they have this wonderful school to teach the gospel and children and uh, train people, uh, men to be preachers and whatnot. And, and that school was recently closed because of COVID. And so we want to pray for uh, Brother Paul and the school over there. Also, uh, uh, Rebecca Lemon, who is a uh, Jerry's uh, stepdaughter, and uh, Jerry uh, is a member of the Lord's Church, and uh, Rebecca has come down with uh, cancer, and it's looking uh, it's looking terminal. Uh, Gretchen Rood has also been in our prayer list uh, for the past week or so, and she's been in and out, in and out of the hospital, and she is home now recovering from surgery, so we want to keep uh, Gretchen in our prayers. And as always, if you do happen to have uh, something that you'd like us to pray about, you're encouraged to uh, message us directly through Facebook, or you can email me again at minister at ovchurch.org. Let's go ahead and uh, pray, shall we? Most Holy Father, again, we do so thank you for being our God. And Father, there are so many things going on around the world with COVID-19. We pray, Father, for relief. We pray for the skill of the doctors and nurses and those researching to come up with a vaccine. Father, we pray that you help us to uh, stay healthy and to be uh, uh, loving of one another. Father, we ask that you be with those people on our prayer list, especially those struggling with COVID and uh, those struggling with cancer. And Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for uh, uh, Gretchen coming through her surgery and for other folks coming through their treatments. Father, we do thank you for blessing us so much and for the good health we have. Father, we ask that you watch over us in our study today. And in our worship, we pray this all in Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Hebrews. I will read in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, from the New International Word. Herefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders that the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning and shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose hope. I'm pressing on the upward way, new lives I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, or lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Oh, 
defend every sin, reach out to claim their darkest way. How could this be part of the plan? If I could only hold your hand and touch the scars when nails were driven, I would need to feel your side. sins. 
And as we partake of this unleavened bread in whatever form it might take, Father, help us to remember Jesus always. In his name we pray. One of the things you have to do with one of these little cups is you have to carefully peel this foil off. And if not, you're going to spill the grape juice all over the place. The very first time that I used one of these, I got grape juice all over my shirt. And I wasn't sure if those stains would ever come out. Thankfully, I have a very good life. Think about the blood that was spilt on the cross and how that blood stayed there staining our Lord's skin but that blood took the stain off of me the stain of sin and so again while these cups are different and inconvenient for a time in some ways they've helped me to appreciate our Lord's sacrifice in a different way let's pray Father God in heaven, again, we do so thank you for the blood of Christ shed on the cross for our sins. And Father, as we share this cup today, may we all remember that spilt blood so that we could have the stain of sin removed from our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. That concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we do take up the offering. And of course, at this time, we are not passing plates or anything like that because of COVID, so we have a, a box in the back for people, and that's really convenient if you're here. But if you're not here, well, you could always send in a donation any way that you see fit, whether it's by mail or, or bill pay or we're just dropping it off. But I want to encourage you with these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7 as you consider supporting the ministry here at Orange Vale and around the world that we help out. There in 2 Corinthians 9, we're told to remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so today, if, if you feel the desire to give because God has put that in your heart, I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, again, we do so thank you for blessing us with all things. And Father, as we come to this time where we give to your church, Father, and the work that the church does. We pray that you will bless us as we give from our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, we do encourage you to sing along with the next hymn that we're going to play before the message. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up by me a fool. You are my all in all. my sin, my cross, my shame, 
Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. This morning at 9 a.m. And when I came to open up the door, I didn't see a line of people waiting outside for me to open up so they could come in and study God's word and sing praises to God. Of course, right now with COVID-19, we're not having indoor assembly. But even before then, I don't ever remember seeing a line waiting to come in. But I have seen people line up and wait for a new Dutch Brothers coffee to open up. And I've also seen people line up for a new Krispy Kreme donut place. And I've also seen people line up for the latest iPhone at an Apple store. And I can tell you some other places that people line up. But I think about that. I think, you know, there's got to be something wrong with this picture, you know? I simply believe that it all comes down to a lack of focus, a lack of focus, or more to the point, a focus on, on superficial things. And so today, we're going to go ahead and continue our sermon series, Finding Joy, A Journey Through Philippians, with something I'm calling the joy of focus, joy of focus. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27 encourages us to not give the devil a foothold. To not give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't give the devil any help in taking over your life. Just don't do it. Now think about it. You know, we've given the devil a foothold if he can get one of us to lose our zeal and become apathetic and uninvolved in spiritual things. And we've given the devil a foothold if, if he can get us to be uninterested in growing and learning and, and working and giving. We've given the devil a foothold. We've done any of that. But we're not letting the devil in at all when we're filled with zeal and commitment and, and eagerness to grow and to serve God's kingdom. Think about it. Where's your focus? Where's your focus? Are we trying with all our heart to, to do the Christian life as well as we can? Are we devoting our whole selves completely to the Christian walk? Start thinking, well, is there some place in the Bible that we can find 
where we have a good example. Well, yeah, of course there is, right? Without a doubt, I think the Apostle Paul was that kind of a Christian. He was committed and he was focused on the Lord with an incredible zeal and passion that has been hardly come close to being matched. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 16. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 16. We're going to go ahead and take a look at his example. There Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Or attained, sorry. Okay. So, looking at that text, what Paul is doing is comparing our spiritual journey with a race. A race. And how it's important to be disciplined in order to win the race and not be disqualified. Think about it. You know, right now, there's no way that I can hope to win a marathon, much less a race. I haven't done any training for it. I... You know, I don't even know if I can win such a thing, much less cross the finish line. But I could train. I could practice. I could dedicate myself to winning the race. And then who knows? And, and you know, and when it comes to our spiritual journey, we need that same kind of training. You just can't hope that it happens, you know? You know, you need that same kind of dedication if we ever hope to make it to the end of the race. And that kind of spiritual stamina, again, just doesn't happen. You just don't you know, sit around and get zapped into you. That's because just like training for an actual marathon, it's something that we actually really need to work on and stick to it. And in our text today, Paul encourages us with five principles to help us spiritually press on toward the goal of finishing the Christian race. And the first principle that Paul learned and then shares with the Philippians and us is to be dissatisfied. To be dissatisfied. Again, back in verses 12 and 13, Paul confesses, not that I already have obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Now listen to what he says here. Here's a man who, if you look at the calendar and the timeline, he's been a Christian over 25 years now. And not only that, but he's an apostle. He has spoken directly with Jesus Christ. And he has been given the spiritual gifts of an apostle. He can bring people back to life, like Eutychus. He could impart the Holy Spirit, and he's done that. He could, you know, he could perform miracles, okay? But he says in these two verses that he's not there yet. And I'm thinking if he's not there yet, I'm never going to be there, you know? And so while he is satisfied with his life in Christ, that Christ has cleansed him of his sins, you know, he's not satisfied with how well he's living for Christ. And that's because his dissatisfaction, his dissatisfaction with his life in Christ is the first thing that's important for making progress in the Christian race. Follow me for a second. Think about what he's saying. He's saying that he is not there yet. 
And so he has to continue to grow and to press toward that goal. And again, if the Apostle Paul wasn't there yet, if he hadn't reached it, you might say, well, how in the world can any of us ever, you know, be there? How can we ever say that we have studied enough or that we've learned enough or that we've served enough, you know, or that we've just done enough, period? You know, if we ever, ever, ever come to the point where we believe that we have done enough, well, that's the point at which we stop growing. That's the point where we stop maturing in Christ. Truth is, dissatisfaction is essential for spiritual growth. It's essential for any progress. If you're happy where you are, that's where you're going to stay. Let's put it that way. You know? Think about it. If people were satisfied with a car that gets seven miles to the gallon, we would never have a car today that can get 40 miles to the gallon. Or maybe if people were we're satisfied with computers the size of, uh, let's say, the Memorial Auditorium in Sacramento. They were quite large, you know. We would never have things like cell phones and tablets that could fit in the palm of your hand with thousands of times more powerful than one of those machines back then that would fit in one of those large auditoriums. The point is that maturing Christians honestly evaluate themselves. You have to evaluate yourself and strive to do better each and every day. Each and every day. Again, the first principle that will help us spiritually press toward the goal is to be dissatisfied. The second principle is to be devoted. To be devoted. Again, back in our text, this time in verses 13 and 14, Paul says this. He says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now there in verse 13, he talks about the one thing he does. You say, well, wait a second, only one? Only one? I mean, I'm a multitasker myself. But here he says that we should focus on just one thing. In other words, that's the primary focus. No one's saying that you shouldn't take care of your kids or have a job or stuff like this. But if your primary focus is God, then all those things are going to work out. You see, he says we need to focus on one thing. And again, that's hard to do for a lot of people because we tend to define ourselves by the 50 or so things that we dabble in rather than the one thing that I do. But think about Paul again. He had a singular focus that some might call a bit of an obsession. But that just means that no matter where he was or what he was doing, his focus was on Jesus. And so if he's out sailing on the Mediterranean when he's on his way to Rome to, to meet uh, you know, the emperor in chains, his focus was on Jesus. If he's out there speaking in the synagogues or out in the marketplace, being a tent maker, his focus is on Jesus. Writing letters to the churches, his focus is on Jesus. Sitting chained up in a prison cell with Silas or, or whoever he happens to be with at the time, because I'm sure he was in prison more than once or whatever's recorded in the scriptures, guess what? His focus is on Jesus. For Paul, every situation was faced in view of his relationship with Christ. With Christ and the goal of being heavenward bound. And because of that, Paul was able to grow spiritually, personally. And with that personal spiritual growth, he continued to be used by God and to grow the kingdom. Being devoted to our spiritual goal helps us to live what matters the most and to have our priorities in order. The second principle that will help us spiritually and press toward the goal again is to be devoted. To be devoted. The next principle, our third principle, is to be directed. Be directed. Again, we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, 
I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Take a look at verse 13 again. Paul says he forgets what's behind and strains toward what's ahead. Think about it. One of the keys to making progress in every aspect of life is to have the right direction. And you get that right direction by keeping your eyes focused on the present and the future instead of the past. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't learn from history and from the past and we don't study that stuff and try to understand it. It just means that our goal needs to be in front of us, okay? Not behind us. Just imagine, let's, let's stay with that running illustration, the whole thing that Paul's got going here in Philippians. Just imagine runners all running in a race and they're all running in the race looking backwards. You know, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of imagine, maybe I, I, I find that too much kind of like humorous, but I kind of picture people running backwards, uh, looking the wrong way or whatever, and, and they're bumping into each other and trees and falling in fountains and rolling down hills and whatever. But um, I, I doubt that any of those people would ever come close to finishing the race, except maybe by accident. That's because they don't know where they're going, much less where the goal is, because they're too busy looking behind them. And that's why it's important for us to know where we're headed and stay focused if we ever expect to get there. When it comes to the past, well, you know, sure we might have had some successes in the past, might have had some failures too. As a matter of fact, we probably have more failures than successes in our lives, right? But if we focus on the successes, then we tend not to move beyond them. Because we think, hey, you know, we've done it that way and it worked before, so we're going to keep doing it that way no matter what, even if it's not working anymore, you know. And if we focus on our failures, then we tend to just kind of give up and figure, why bother? It's like, oh, I failed then, I failed then, I'm going to fail again, so just, why bother? But think about Paul. This man had an excellent upbringing. He had the best teacher, and really what anyone in his time would call a successful life. But he also had some failures too, especially when it comes to spiritual matters, like being a persecutor and a murderer of Christians. But he found forgiveness and a new life in Jesus. Either way, he didn't focus on his past. Not the good stuff or the bad stuff. And that's because, hey, the past was, it's past. It's past. It's important for us to live and to serve in the present and to strive for the future if we ever hope to move forward and closer to our goal. And so, as we run the Christian race, we need to be directed toward the present and the future. Because if our focus is backward, We'll just end up tripping and falling all over the place. Right? The fourth principle that will help us be spiritually, that will help us to spiritually press forward to our goal is to be determined. Be determined. Once again, I want us to take a look at verses 13 and 14, but this time we're going to focus on the last part of verse 13, where Paul writes that we are to be straining toward what is ahead. Some other translations like the ESV and I think the New American Standard says reaching forward, okay? Now the Greek word that Paul used here is epitekonomai. I'm going to say that rather badly even though, hey, I've got a Greek background and I studied this. Greek words aren't that easy. It's Greek to me, but it's epitekonomai. Epitekonomai. That's the word, okay? Anyway, it's a word that we see that is used for runners who are really giving it their all to win the race. And so if, what you kind of have to do is picture this runner, right? And he's headed toward a finish line, and the tape is stretched across it, and he's there, and he's pumping. You know, he's got his arms up. You know, you can see the muscles in his legs, and they're just all tense, and, and he's clawing at the air, and he's just got every muscle into this whole thing. As he reaches, he stretches across the line to break that tape, you know? That's what we're talking about here. That's the kind of spiritual drive and effort that Paul says 
he was putting into his walk with Christ and that he was determined to do and to be. He was determined to be God's servant with that kind of determination. He was determined to accomplish God's mission. And he was determined to receive God's reward. Now, that all said, Paul's determination didn't all come from him. Because over in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29, Colossians 1, 29, Paul confessed this, he says, To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. So who is this his energy? Well, it's, it's God's, right? It's God's. It says, you know, in other words, God's power was at work in him, helping him to be determined. And if you're a Christian, then God's power is at work in you too. Maybe not in the same way as Paul, but God is still with you. So let's be determined like Paul. Let's be determined. Determined to accomplish God's mission and determined to receive God's reward. Again, the fourth principle that will help us spiritually press toward the goal is to be determined. The fifth principle is to be disciplined. Disciplined. Back in our main text in Philippians chapter 3, and this time we're going to go to the latter part of our passage, verses 15 and 16. Paul tells us that all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Okay, so... What we want to focus on here in these two verses as we wrap things up this morning is the last part of verse 16 where Paul encourages us to live up to what we've already obtained. Attained. So what does he mean by that? Well, it's about consistent Christian living as the result of spiritual discipline. You know, because if you really, if you think about the whole thing, it takes discipline to maintain consistent attention on any important goal. And that's true if you're talking about eating healthy or exercise or spending money wisely or saving. It's, it, you need discipline. Okay. It's also true, though, when it comes to spiritual things. In other words, it's important to regularly practice spiritual discipline need to do that in order to maintain our spiritual health just like you would regularly go to the gym if they were currently open in California or if you would you know, eat healthy you know you need to regularly do that if you hope to maintain your health you know and when it comes to spiritual disciplines you know those disciplines you know they, they include things like assembling whenever the church does and I know you know we have difficulties now in assembling physically but we could do it virtually, you know, or uh, Bible classes. And again, you say, well, I can't seem to do that physically. Well, I tell you, we live in a time period where technology is, has allowed us to have Bible classes anywhere in the world with anybody, as long as they're connected to the internet. And we've got those opportunities. You need to be regularly participating in those. Regular Bible reading and prayer and so on, you know. The point being that if we want to make any kind of progress toward the spiritual goal of maturity in Christ, then we need to maintain a discipline of healthy spiritual practices. Again, that doesn't all come from us, but we get help from God. You know, and with help from God, we can reach that goal. It's not impossible. But we have to do our part by being dissatisfied, by being devoted, by being directed, by being determined, and by being disciplined. It's the joy of focus. You know, Bible history and our own personal experiences tell us that many people who begin the Christian race don't always finish. And while I would like to say that I know why they didn't finish, and that I know how to fix it, I'll have to admit that I really don't. 
And that's because there's so many reasons why people quit and give up on the Lord that I can't even begin to list them all because no one even knows them all. But when we look at people who have gone through incredible life changes and have decided to dedicate themselves to the Lord, we see them finishing the race. Again, I take the Apostle Paul, for example, this, this is what he said over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And just how did Paul manage to do that? How did he keep on pressing toward the goal? Well, by what we talked about today, right? By being dissatisfied, devoted, directed, determined, and disciplined. And the thing is, again, we can do that too. As a matter of fact, we need to. We need to keep pressing toward the prize because the prize is eternal life with Christ Jesus. And if you're not reaching toward the prize yet, you can be. By becoming a Christian, you can do that today. All you need to do is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and upon your trust in Him, to turn to Him in repentance, confessing Him as Lord and Savior, and then commit yourself to Him by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. And then rising up out of the water, you continue to live your life for Him until Jesus comes back again, or you go to be with Him. And for those of us right now who already are trying to reach toward the prize and are striving for the prize. For those of us who are already Christians, well, I want to encourage you to not get lazy, to not quit, to not be satisfied, but instead dig down deep and be zealous for the Lord and, and keep on keeping on, push forward, keep pushing forward. Again, if anyone has the need to share or seek prayer to become a Christian for the very first time, I'd like to encourage you to message us directly through Facebook, or you can email me at minister at obchurch.org. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we do so thank you for your son. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in heaven. Father, we pray that you help us to live every day for you, to strive for that heavenly goal, to keep focused on your Son. And Father, as we do that, we pray that you'll bless us and be with us to help us to overcome and to continue to reach toward the goal. Father, we thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we want to thank you for making us a part of your Sunday and pray that you'll worship with us the next time we do meet in Orange Vale. And while we do understand that might not be for a while, we do hope that you'll continue to assemble with us Sunday mornings at 11 here on Facebook. Thank you, and God bless. How do you expect pain? How do you describe? Listen to
to my heart. Every beat will say, thank you for the light, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way. So listen to our heart. song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. So listen to our hearts. Words are not enough to tell you 